is the name of our presentation. And we are going to discuss the history a little bit of women's hats. We have some of our historic photos. As you can see, they're from the 1920s. And headwear for women. Hold on, let me just pop my video off so we're not distracted. All right. So headwear for women. Um, began in earnest during the Middle Ages when the church decreed that hair um, must be covered for women. However, headwear has been recorded in paintings in the Neolithic cave of Algeria starting about 4,000 years ago. The first example was the head wrap, and this has been later seen in Mesopotamian sculptures. Um, female figures, they use various hat shapes, mostly starting with head wraps. Since then, hats have been worn as both a functional accessory as well as a statement of fashion. Um, you can see in the photos to the left of the screen, the women are very clearly wearing it as a function, although they do have nice little floral arrangements around. But I think the girl, um, Edwina Miller, at the bottom is more so a fashion statement. So here we have four of our hats that are in our collections. We have many, many hats in our collections. And I selected these four to start. So the top lace cloche hat is from Ivy Cromartie Stranahan. She is considered the mother of Fort Lauderdale. The cloche was um, the iconic hat of the 1920s. And Though it's usually described as a bell-shaped crown, it soon became designated for streamlining the tight-fitting hats that we see in the 1920s. It's worn low and straight over the forehead, almost covering the eyebrows completely, and it was used to create a very slender silhouette for the women. The blue-green feathered um, Juliet cap is also called a Callet cap. It originated in 16th century France and is called the Juliet cap because most of the time you see one is when Juliet of Romeo and Juliet is wearing one. So it has a bit of a pop culture in that sense reference to it. And the 20th century revived the Juliet cap. Um, it is originally a French cap as well. It's close fitting. It sits on the face um, with no visor or brim or I should say on the head and it contours to the person's head. Today, we see them most when it comes to weddings or the royal families. The rather feathered cap at the bottom is a beret. And berets first became fashionable also during the 20s. In 1928, France, Spain, and Italy were manufacturing millions of berets. Um, the new uh, French films brought the revival in the 1960s and it took a revolutionary turn for berets. Um, Cuban leaders Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, as well as many other um, revolutionary groups in the 70s, such as the Black Panthers, um, the Brown Berets, Young Lords Party, and Guardian Angels, all started wearing berets. So it has a more military connotation in today's society than it does a fashion statement. But it became a fashion popularity again in the 1990s, and we do still see it though as a statement of the military. And this lovely hat at the bottom is a straw hat with a high crown. And it is actually from one of our department stores here in Fort Lauderdale, um, Bird Irons. It was uh, historically originated on Andrews Avenue in the 1920s. It's the photo down here and the left-hand corner is the new, or the new Bird Irons. It doesn't exist anymore. But that photo is from the 1950s. So here on our left, we have a pillbox hat. And this pillbox hat is very, very opulent. They're usually not. They're usually much more um, subtle and elegant and simple. They have usually, it's usually one color. Um, the most famous person to wear the pillbox hat, who also made the pillbox hat as famous as it is, was Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, she wore a bone white wool pillbox hat um, when we first see her for the inauguration for President Kennedy. And then she also won, was wearing one during his assassination. But they began in the 1930s. The basic design um, hat makers made to 
as just a new style to cover the head. It's small, brimless, it features straight sides and a usually level top. And they're popular because of their simplicity. You see another cloche next to it. This is a little more fancy one. It has an actual larger brim and the bow, which accents it, accents it. And then the yellow velour hat with the high crown is just another um, hat to wear to keep the sun off. And here we also have another hat that would block the sun down here in Florida. It's a, just a large brim black velvet hat, maybe a little hot for down here in Florida with the velvet brim with being velvet. We have another pink silk Juliet cap with a white Lily of the Valley trim. And you can see in the side of this photo that it has um, the combs to stick it to your head to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Bobby pins, combs, those were used to keep the Juliet caps in place. And here we have another pillbox hat, also not subtle or simple. It's plastic leaves and um, pansies and violets adorned to it. So these hats were all donated by Mrs. Gordon Moore in 1974. Or I shouldn't say all of them. The Ivy Stranahan hat was not donated. It was donated by Ivy Stranahan. They are used in our exhibits. Um, we change out fashion throughout our museum, so they get used and everything like that. But um, women's hats here, they hold a very special memory for the people of Fort Lauderdale and Broward County. And for the span of 40 plus years, um, we associated one person with hats and her name is Easter Lily Gates. And here we have three lovely pictures of her. As you can see, she has some very over the top big hats just in these two photos. So Easter Lily Bilbo, she was born in Des Moines, Iowa on Easter Sunday in 1889. That is how she got her name. Her great grandmother dubbed her Easter Lily. Her family moved across the Midwest throughout her childhood and they eventually settled in Utah. It was during her childhood that Easter Lily developed a certain interest in hats. Often as her family moved from state to state, um, in a covered wagon, Easter Lily could be found designing and making hats for her dolls. She says in a interview that she never made dresses or clothes, but it was always, always hats. At 17, Easter Lily was a beginner hat designer for Werner's millinery, or millinery store in Ogden, Utah. It was at Werner's that Easter Lily met her husband, George Gates. They married three years later on January 20th, 1910. And in this photo, you can see it's Easter Lily with her big hat, her eldest, or, and at that time, her only um, child, Bob, and then her husband, George. So the couple moved to Florida on March 19th, um, or in March 1918. They purchased an orange and grapefruit grove. Uh, the grove ended up getting burnt and they had to leave that trade and they were forced, or George was forced to go back to plumbing. And Easter Lily, who had no idea what a baby turkey looked like, went into the business of raising turkeys. She sold breeding stock and eggs all over the Southern states and Cuba. And she even packaged up chicks, which were shipped to the various parts of Florida. And at that time, it was pretty much unheard of to ship um, poultry, live poultry at least, anywhere. The farm was sold in 1924 and the Gates family invested in and moved to Fort Lauderdale. And at that time, George became ill two years later. You can see her lovely, very flamboyant hat. So when the hurricane of 1926 hit, which is a devastating hurricane for Fort, La for Fort Lauderdale and pretty much all of South Florida, um, the family itself went through a very hair-raising experience and they lost everything. In an interview, uh, Easter Lily recalls the storm surge flooding the first floor of their house on Broward Boulevard. She said Broward Boulevard looked like a river. So just imagine a river running down your street at one point in time. She moved her two sons, um, at that time they were seven and three, up to the second floor and then went back down for George, her husband, who at that point in time of his life was pretty much paralyzed from his disease. And here we have some pictures of Easter Lily as well. And I love throughout all of her interviews that she has, um, someone always brings up hats. 
And here we have then too, she doesn't have to dress her hair um, when she's going someplace. She just has to put a hat on. So unfortunately, George died a few weeks later. He died in December and Easter Lily was tasked with finding a job to support herself and her two young children. She heard the school board was looking for someone to drive a school bus and at the time women did not drive buses. She met with the secretary of the superintendent and the secretary said, absolutely not. That's not something women do. So she left, but she ended up meeting the superintendent in the grocery store later that day. And she told him what she wanted to do and she was hired. She became the first female bus driver in Broward County. She was paid $20 a month, but later ended up working at a variety store for $7 a week. And it was during her work at the variety store that her friends told her about the job opening for supervisor of elections. So in this picture in the center one, the three women and the man. So the woman all the way to the left is vice mayor at this point in time, Virginia Schumann Young. And then there is Ruth Schmidt and Bruno Schmidt and Easter Lily Gates. They're attending the 50th anniversary of Port Everglades. And at the bottom, we have Easter Lily swearing in people to vote. And her top is just her in the office, her office. So Easter Lily served as supervisor of elections and registration of voters for Broward County. She won her first election in 1928 by 2,200 votes. And at that point in time, Broward County only had 5,000 voters. She ran unopposed for 20 years. And during her second 20 years, she met Republican opposition, but always won decisively. In this photo on the left, where she's standing at the podium, she's discussing how the voting will happen and how all the um, ballots will be counted with everyone who's volunteering to help. So her main focus was to get voting machines and permanent registration processes as the county's population soared. Her advocacy for machines began in 1934. However, the county did not obtain voting machines until 1950. And this only happened after several workers passed out. The people declined to serve the long hours required to count the votes. Duty could last up to 39 hours at a stretch. And during the primary, before machines were put into general election, Easter Lily was on duty from 6 a.m. Tuesday until 9 a.m. Friday with only five hours of sleep during that time. And it was at that moment, Easter Lily became known as the woman of iron. And here you have her teaching how to use the voting machines, as well as she's putting the votes into the vault that's underneath the Broward County Courthouse or at that time. So during her tenure, she registered the first African Americans and the first nine Seminole Indians to vote in the county. The top right hand corner picture is Easter Lily with the Seminole chief at the time. And she, and she has a statement that she, I'm quoting from her. She said, they had a powwow first. I went out to the reservation and told them how it worked. We all sat around campfires. Easter Lily also wrote a bill that passed in 1947 legislature for the new permanent registration. The state law passed it in 1951, enabling all counties to have permanent registration by 1960. She received the Women of the Year 1955 by Business and Professional Women of Fort Lauderdale. Also the Business and Professional Women of District 10, which consisted of 17 clubs all the way from Palm Beach to Key West. So spanning the entirety of the southern, eastern southern part of Florida. In the photo on the top um, left is Easter Lily sitting in her house with all of the kitschy stuff that she's gathered over time and people have given her. And at the bottom left, she's also once again helping someone learn how to use the voting machines. And the bottom right is them counting the votes during one of the elections. So Easter Lily, she held her office from January 1st, 1929 to January 1st, 1969. When she retired, she was succeeded by another long serving supervisor, Jane Carroll. Under her tenure, voter registration grew from 5,000 to 20, or 245,000 voters. 
And at the age of 92, Easter Lily moved from Fort Lauderdale to Temple Terrace in Tampa to be closer to her family. She passed away in February of 1985 at the age of 95. The photo in the center is of DeWitt up the Grove. He was the um, supervisor of elections for Palm Beach County. And then we have Easter Lily and she always campaigned also. Um, she held a parade every year to help uh, crippled children at that point in time. And in the bottom photo, she is in her office or in a office. So this is the handwritten postcard from East Lily Gates. She's writing to a friend, um, stating that she is going to be moving to Temple Terrace to be with her children and grandchildren, but that she will love and misses Broward County itself, but she'd come back to say hello. So Easterly was a true pioneer. Um, her friends and family state that she led a beautiful life and was a real inspiration to everyone who knew her. And here we have a quote from the Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, uh, which she was also a part of. And it's a wonderful quote that I think does encapsulate Easterly. She says, Mrs. Gates has been a symbol of versatility and strength as she both figuratively and literally designed and displayed the many hats that have become her trademark. Um, we are here the fourth Thursday of every month. And I believe next month is going to be information. I think it's going to be on the 1926 hurricane with photos that we have. because We have many, many photos from that hurricane. And then the month after for May is going to be about another woman, historic woman. Her name is Patricia Murphy. She had a perfume company in the 1960s, as well as she started a restaurant here down in Fort Lauderdale at Bahia Mar. No questions? Oh, let's see. Yes, she is pretty awesome. <laughs> yep. We have a lot of... Um, very powerful historic women here in Fort Lauderdale since um, Florida was kind of like the last frontier for the United States. It was very, wasn't really settled. Um, I mean, people were not actually settled here in Fort Lauderdale till pretty much the 1890s. So the women were kind of, had to be strong. It's, it was a swamp full of gators and hurricanes. <laughs> so yes. And if you want to follow us on Facebook, or you can see this again, it's going to be posted on YouTube, or if you want to follow us on Instagram, there's our tags. All right, everyone, thank you for stopping by, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>